now we get into this question of well, what are the grounds for mm. uh, for a biblical divorce? Because sometimes divorce happens and it doesn't follow in these biblical kind of guidelines. But I want to talk about what the rabbis, um, the the teachers of the ancient Israelites, how they categorized the grounds for biblical divorce. There were there are three categories that they would use, and underneath that we can flesh out um, different distinctions. But these are the three categories. The first one is unfaithfulness. Mm. Unfaithfulness. Now, it's really interesting. I, and you know, this is what I do for fun. Last night, I went through ancient Near Eastern contracts as many as I could, you know? Yeah, because you know what? That's just what I want to do on well, an evening at home. I just want to go through ancient Near East contracts. That's, that's right. That's do how you I do that while you're watching basketball? I, I was going to say Jim knows me really well. I, I was watching the Lakers game uh, last night to watch the number two all time greatest player of all oh, time, okay. LeBron James. Um, <laughs> but the interesting thing about many, many, many ancient Near Eastern contracts and even many Greco Roman. So when I say ancient Near Eastern, I'm talking about Old Testament. Mm -hmm. When I talk about Greco-Roman, I'm talking about New Testament. What is the commonality is unfaithfulness is almost always not present. So we ask why? Mm. Why is that? It's because it's, it's assumed. <laughs> it's like the oxygen that we breathe. You know, mm. uh, that I am thinking about breathing and doing the breathing without actual like intentionality. It's just a natural response. In the same way, when these marriage contracts were written, unfaithfulness is a given. So if you are unfaithful through adultery, that instantly breaks the marriage contract and make, it breaks the marriage vow. Okay, what do you mean it was a given? It was understood in that time. It was a normal ethical obligation and responsibility. Hmm. So in other words, you're saying that they expected it they, or they, they expected faithfulness. They expected faithfulness. And so in the presence of unfaithfulness, they understood that that, that unfaithfulness broke the contract of faithfulness. Okay. So it's almost like, I, why would I need to write in something that is already present as the fabric of our society? Is you that, know? Are you saying that it was instantly? So it was understood that if there was unfaithfulness, infidelity, that it instantly it broke, broke the, the contract? contract. You Absolutely. didn't have to say, I'm breaking it or it broke it. It, it broke it. It broke it, wow. absolutely. Now, there are two other um, categories that are really important, and the rabbis teach on this. Uh, one of them is material neglect, and the other one is emotional mm. neglect. Mm. So you've got these three umbrellas, and underneath it, it can be played out in different ways. Material neglect. Now, I'm talking about an ancient world that was patriarchal. Like, we can't get around that. And so there are social kind of responsibilities that a man and a woman would have. But even in this setting, super amazing, super important, that there was this idea that both parties, both man and woman, because they're made in the image and likeness of God, require the dignity, their dignity, value, and worth, which means mm. they both had a responsibility to each other. So the husband's responsibility from a material standpoint is to provide food, to provide clothing, um, from an emotional standpoint, to provide love, um, to provide the ne necessity of emotional intimacy, um, sexual intimacy in that area. And the same was true for the woman, back to the man, that these things were supposed to be there. Now, the ancient rabbis understood that if material neglect was present. And you're not talking about just like, oh, I wish we had a bigger house. No, I'm no. like, we're talking basic material needs. Basic right? material needs. I mean, I'm talking about, um, yeah, like, is there food on the table? Is there um, a safe place to, to live? And so By the way, I thought I heard you say, I'm sure this needs to be edited out because I must have not been listening. They were required, men were patriarchal not, to provide some kind of emotional connection? Oh, yeah. We don't Did have to edit that? that out. That is absolutely true. And so they understood, and actually we'll look at a different passage in Exodus that understood these three things, that love was, was a requirement. Love was a requirement. Gracious. So wow. love is emotional. It's mm -hmm. both. It's, so we're seeing this duality. It is both physical and it is both emotional. Huh. Now, the rabbi, so the val, like where, where does a divorce, when is it valid? Um, the rabbis understood that one of the things that is really important is this thing called a certificate of divorce. So if you go to Deuteronomy uh, 21, uh, verses 1 through 4, it talks about having a certificate of divorce. Why is this really important? Because in this society and in this uh, understanding that um, in order for a divorce to be valid, that the man or the woman has to be able to show, hey, one of these three things has taken place, unfaithfulness, material neglect, or emotional neglect. And in the presence of that, the rabbis would step in almost like a legal system and say, for, especially for the woman who's oftentimes the most innocent and vulnerable and the victim in the situation, she needs protection. 
here, you know? And so they would step in and actually put a penalty on the husband until the husband actually gave a certificate of divorce. The certificate of divorce, by handing it to the woman, it gives her dowry back, which is financial stability. That's what they came into the marriage through. And it made it possible for the woman to get remarried if she chose to get remarried. Okay, so uh, this is wow. this is new and deep, and yeah. I'm so thankful you've done the theological heavy lifting so that we can better understand this. So here's my fear when you say this, because remember, I am pro-marriage. Mm-hmm. I think we all are very pro-marriage and Absolutely. pro-God's design for marriage. Mm-hmm. So where the unfaithfulness seems pretty crystal clear, yep. you know, um, what feels a little squishy to me material and is the material and emotional, I because, know. you know, I— I think there's a lot of talk around um, the need for us to acknowledge emotional abuse, and I 100% agree with that. Um, Emotional abuse exists. It is devastating, and it can also, because our trauma not only happens to us, it happens in us, so it can also really come about with physical consequences, emotional Mm -hmm. abuse. Um, And so I know that it exists, and I'm so glad that we're addressing it here. But there's a big difference between somebody being emotionally abused mm-hmm. and somebody just saying, I don't really feel that yeah, love. Like I'm distant today. Yeah. And so how how like I just want to make sure, like, how how are people quantifying this? Like what or qualifying it? Like, what is the parameter? Because it yeah. feels like that could get people into the mindset, well. He doesn't make me feel loved the way that I want to feel loved. That's right. And then quickly peace out on a marriage. Yeah, so let's let's read this. So in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, this is what Moses says. If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something, and if you're highlighting, you know, taking notes, he, because he finds something indecent, the Hebrew word is ervat davar, about her. So what is this indecency? This becomes a big question. He may write her a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. Now, this gets to the very question, Lisa, that you're asking. What is the context of this emotional neglect? And what is the context of material neglect? Now, the rabbis, and I'm going to get to Jesus, because really we need to filter everything at the end of the day through how Jesus understood this. So we're mm-hmm. going to start with the rabbis um, in this first century because Jesus understood the background that the rabbis established in oral tradition and in the practice of the people of Israel. Then Jesus comes in and actually defines exactly how we ought to think about this. This is um, really interesting. For unfaithfulness, for adultery, for unfaithfulness, the marriage contract was broken. So that was kind of clear cut, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Now, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, the way the Hebrew is structured, and this is really important for Jesus later on, the way the Hebrew is structured is neutral. It it could say that he may get a divorce, Mm -hmm. or it could say that he must. One is an allowance. And there's a big difference. And there is a huge difference. Now, this meant that different rabbis and different teachers had to make an interpretive decision about that. Um, And so then what happened for the rabbis is the way they separate emotional and um, and material neglect is that the first option for them in the presence of these things was not the contract broken. They actually established financial penalties in the presence of this. So we're talking, they were taking steps. They were taking progressive steps. Steps, not leaps. Not leaps. To divorce. That's a good way to put it. 